mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There was a rich man. This is beginning to sound like a broken record. Last week started with, there was a rich man. So what is Jesus trying to tell us? There was a rich man who wore purple clothes. He dressed very regally and very expensively because purple cloth was purple was a hard cloth to find to to make, right? Because they had to dye everything from natural sources. So to dye something purple was not something easy to do. So if you were able to afford purple cloth to make your clothes out of you were rich, which we already know because Jesus says there was a rich man who wore purple cloth and feasted sumptuously every day. Now, how many of you have ever been to a feast before or a banquet with with a very good spread of food, right? Right? A wild game feast. Yeah, that's now imagine doing that every day. Seems a little much, doesn't it? <laughs> right? Even if you have the money and the resources to do that, it seems a little much. And at his gate lay who? Lazarus. Do you notice that? The story starts with, there was a rich man, and at his gate lay Lazarus. So why does the poor man have a name? Why? Because he's important. But why isn't the rich rich man important? According to society, the rich man would be important and the poor man would not. I've got a couple names here that I'm just going to throw out and we'll come back to them later. But I want to show of hands to see who knows who these names are. Keith Scott. Terrence Crutcher. Saw three hands for those two names. We'll get back to that in just a moment. This story tells us a lot about what Jesus thinks heaven's going to be like, right? It's about heaven and hell. That's what this text is about, right? It's about heaven and hell. That's what this text is about, right? Okay, I got a definite answer there. I don't know if that's the answer I'm looking for, but that's a definite answer, right? Because Abraham... It says that Lazarus died, was carried off by the angels to be with, who, by the way, was a very rich man. He had lots of land. He had lots of of cattle. He had lots of beasts. He had lots of money. Abraham was a very rich man. So the one thing that you need to hear clear and concise is that being rich does not mean that you're not going to heaven, right? Right? Because that's some ways we could take sometimes the gospel text. Because Jesus talks a lot about rich people and how if you're rich, you can't. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, right? The eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. But just because you're rich doesn't mean you won't <coughs> obtain that time with God. Because Abraham was a very rich man, and Lazarus, who was a poor man, who laid at the gate of a very rich man, was taken by the angels to be with Abraham. And across a great fixed chasm. That's what really worries me most about this passage. There's a couple things in this passage that really just don't make it very gospel-like. But a very, a very large fixed chasm. The rich man is in Hades and being tormented. And he shouts across to Abraham and says, Send Lazarus. Now, how did the man know the, Lazarus' name? How did the rich man know who the man was standing with Abraham? He saw him at his gate every day. Maybe. Maybe. But yeah, that's probably a good answer. It is a good answer, but and it might be a right answer. It doesn't say in the text, though, right? It doesn't. That, see, that's the other thing that, wor- that troubles me about this text is it doesn't actually say in the text how this rich man treated Lazarus. Other than the fact that he ate sumptuously every day and Lazarus laid at his gate wanting to eat the scraps that fell from the table. And he wasn't strong enough to push the dogs away. I thought it was appropriate on Animal Blessing Day. Then He wasn't strong enough to push the dogs away who were coming to lick his sores. 
He was so weak that he wasn't able to, to shoo away the dogs. But how did the rich man know Lazarus' name? Maybe because he saw him every day and he walked over him as he went into his house. Maybe because Lazarus was wearing a name tag. You know, maybe when you first get to be with Father Abraham, you have to wear a name tag for a while so that everybody knows who... No, probably not. You see, the, the sin that this man did, this rich man, what was his sin? Ignoring, stepping over, not sharing. He had an overabundance of stuff that was his, right? And he had plenty for himself. He could have easily have brought Lazarus into his house. The word here for La- where Lazarus, it says that Lazarus was laying at the gate. And at his gate, a poor man laid covered with, with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. The word there for, for lay is not actually he laid down himself. It was he was put there. He was probably escorted out of the rich man's house at some point in time. But the rich man's sin, if there is a sin that's going to wind him up into hell, is indifference. When we do our confession, we confess... It wasn't in our confession this morning, but those of you who are lifelong Lutherans remember the old confession of forgive me of the things for the things that I have done and the things I have failed to do or not done. Right? When the rich man steps over Lazarus, he ignores him. And by not doing something when you see an injustice, is supporting the oppressor that's doing the injustice. Right? All of our texts this morning point us towards looking at and seeing people for who they are as God created them to be, not what we first see them as or judge them as. Those two names that I lifted for you, the three hands that said they knew who the first one was, or the second one was, right? Terrence Crutcher was a man who was shot in Oklahoma. Yeah. Monday. Keith Scott was a man who was shot in Charlotte, North Carolina on Tuesday. There's a lot of things happening right now in our country that we could talk on and on about, and I'm not going to say who's right and who's wrong. But the, the just of the matter is, no matter how far or what you want to say is the actual issue, I want to say the actual issue is the fact that we're not seeing each other as brothers and sisters of Christ as Christ has made us. We're not seeing each other for who God sees us as. We're not seeing each other for the way that God created us to be in this world, as one race, one body, gathered together in His name. All of this injustice that's happening is everybody's fault because none of us are seeing each other as God created us to be. And that's what it comes down to. I saw a great video this morning. I posted it on my Facebook page. Those of you who are my friends, you can look at it later. It talked about how we get into the trouble that we get into because of labels. When a baby is born, it doesn't know that it's Asian. It doesn't know that it's black. It doesn't know that it's white. The way that it learns that is by people telling it that and enforcing that and teaching that. Labels get us into trouble when we start talking about us and them. I've seen lots of stories this week on Facebook that just make me want to sit down and cry because of the state of what's happening in our world. One, I'm going to read a couple of them for you. One is from, and I'm not going to read the whole stories. One of them is just part of a letter that a friend of mine who just got elected bishop to the Delaware, Maryland Synod wrote to his, to his synod after he met with a congregation. Um, and he writes in his letter a little bit of a snippet of what happened when he went to meet with this congregation. And he met, went to meet with this congregation. He's sitting there talking to him. And one person at this meeting says, Bishop, I know you're new, but I want to be clear. When you send us a new pastor, no blacks, no women, no gays. Bill says, I was stunned and then I was angry. And Bill responded, then no pastor, I said. Obviously, there's still work here to be done in the interim time at your church. There are no separate rosters for people of color, women, or the LGBTQ community. When we recognize that, God just might surprise us with a partnership we never could have possibly imagined. 
when we can get beyond what we see people labeled as, we might actually see a person that could have an impact on our lives and have something to give us that we couldn't possibly have without them. Another story comes from a friend of mine who lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, where they're going through the riots right now in the streets after this man was gun- was killed by police. In this story, I'm going to read this story word for word. So this is a story from my friend Charlie Mobley. I just had a... I just had a very amazing and emotional connection with a young black man working at a place I'm eating lunch. He sat me as the host. I'm eating alone today. It was a little awkward, and I spoke first. I extended my hand, and he took it. I asked how he was. He said, I'm good. How are you? It wasn't a normal exchange. You could feel the underlying feelings. And I told him my heart went out to him today and was thinking about how he must be feeling. He opened up like a zipper. He pulled out his phone and shared with me a picture. It was of him and a white friend, both wearing T-shirts that read, End Racial Terrorism. He started to talk about his family, his uncle that was a policeman that had to work in this situation. He talked about his younger family members that were watching on TV and scared and confused. He said, I don't know what to think, it's just crazy. I told him that he was a good man and I told him that I was hurting for him and that was that I was aware that some white people have made some very ignorant statements and I wanted him to know that I didn't look at him like anyone that would riot. He told me he understood that all white people were not like that and all police are not bad. And we both looked at each other and said, God bless you. And there's a good uh, an understanding in this world and we can find common ground if we look for it. Look in the mirror and it starts with the person you're looking at. I appreciate this young man. And he showed me today that which I suspected. There is still hope. If we can look in the mirror, as Charlie said, and see the person standing there and know that the problem starts with me, we all have something to do with this. And that's the first step in admitting that somehow we play a part in this, whether we feel like we do or not. In some way, in some situation, we are still perpetuating a system that has been put into place by many people before us to see people by a label rather than as a child of God. So let us look upon each other with the eyes that God gives us and see the heart that He has put into them and understand that we are all in this together because that's truly what it's about. It's about seeing people the way that God sees them and loving them as your brother and sister in Christ. So let's go do that and change the world here and let that effect ripple out to everywhere else.